Salut film fans! Welcome to my ongoing coverage of French films during what I'm calling the French Spring. Um, we've got two films left to go including this one and today is actually the 21st of June so maybe spring's over but <laughs> we'll run a little bit into summer. I'll have a poll up soon about what I might do next and the three things I'm kind of thinking of and you can check the poll for details are mumblecore films, the films of John Sayles and punk films including an examination of what's that mean? What is a punk film? In these discussions of French films over the last couple of months uh, I've alluded to and sometimes talked directly about these 60s and 70s films um, analysis of or reference to French colonialism. And with the film under discussion today we're dealing with a situation where the film confronts French colonialism head on. Sometimes in elusive ways, in subtle ways, but sometimes in very overt ways. And it does so with a kind of naturalistic elliptical power that makes it just an incredibly, not just great film, but it's not my favorite term to use, but I would say important film. So join me as we discuss the 1988 movie Chocolat in this episode of What Makes This Film Great. Chocolat was directed by Claire Denis, the great sort of late 20th century and still contemporary French director. Um, it's her first feature film and it is somewhat based on her life as a child which she spent much of in various countries in Africa living with her father who was a French sort of functionaire or I don't think he was quite a diplomat but who worked for the French kind of colonial, colonial outreach. <laughs> uh, the film was written by Denis with Jean-Paul Fargo who was a regular collaborator with Denis. It features wonderful cinematography by Robert Alazraki and a great score by the South African jazz pianist um, Abdullah Ibrahim and it's a fantastic soundtrack and if you haven't listened to Ibrahim's music I highly recommend searching him out. He's just a wonderfully playful, incredibly talented um, pianist who mixes kind of classical jazz, modern jazz, African music in a really playful and wonderfully kind of provocative way so check out his music. The cast includes Isaac de Bancolet, Julia Boski, Cécile Ducasse plays the young France and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Bancolet is someone I first became aware of because he pops up in a lot of the sort of 90s and early 2000s Jim Jarmusch films. Uh, you might know him as the French taxi driver from Night on Earth and he's also a really important character in Ghost Dog which another check it out if you haven't. Mm, Jim Jarmusch for another time. <laughs> Okay, before we get into it, a few commenters have mentioned that I should make it clear that there are spoilers in my reviews. So I'm doing that now. There are spoilers in this review. Um, this isn't the kind of movie with major twists and turns, so the spoilers aren't going to ruin it for you. But if you haven't seen Chocolat, just know that I am going to talk about some of the key plot and character points throughout the film including the end. So what's the film about? It's really kind of three films all in one and the way that Denis and company weave these films together to make one sort of organic whole is, is one of the things that makes it so powerful. Um, briefly we get a framing device of a woman who seems to be kind of in her mid to late 20s. Her name is France and she is kind of hitchhiking around Africa. We find out eventually Cameroon and she meets a uh, father and son and they speak French with each other and we're going to find out some inter interesting things about them in the second half of the film. Um, but this, this sequence or this series of scenes creates a, a bookend framing device. Um, 
and the film contained in those probably added up they equal about 15 minutes of film time is a kind of brief but important to the film look at post-colonial Africa again in this case Cameroon um, including I think some very sort of trenchant but briefly observed points about the expectations about what post-colonial Africa would be, could be, and the reality of what post-colonial Africa, again in this case Cameroon, is. But importantly for the narrative of the film, this opening sequence, especially when, when France meets these two and they start to drive through the countryside, serves as a springboard into her recollections of her youth. And it's accomplished via a really wonderful edit as France and the father and son are driving through Cameroon and she looks out the window and we get this. It's really well done and it's gonna happen again and I'll come back to it later in the film. But that leads to the long first half of the flashback, which is kind of the second story that the film is telling. France was a little girl who grew up in Cameroon where her father was a French administrator in the late kind of waning days of colonialism. And she and her father and mother live in a house, kind of like a farmhouse, in the, the dry part of Cameroon, in the countryside, where they administer, it, it, it's never a specific, but kind of, it, it, it seems like the rights to natural resources. Um, the father goes hunting or goes surveying the hunting situation. Um, and there are several towns nearby, or it's implied, we only really see one of them nearby, that he seems to have administrative control over. Um, they're a young couple. It's not mentioned, but they appear to be kind of early 30s. And France is about 10 years old in this. And for the first half of the film, again roughly, uh, or the first half of this like flashback sequence, the memories of the adult France, we get an extended se sequence where the father, Mark, has gone away with some of the African men to explore the territory. Um, it's not explicitly stated, at least as far as I can tell, what they're doing, they're hunting, they're traveling. He says he has to take care of some things and he goes off to do that. And he leaves his wife, Emi, and the sort of head boy, Prote, played by Bancolet, in charge of the household. Merci, Prote. Je te les confie. Veille sur elle. This film, <laughs> this first half of the flashback, is kind of episodic in nature, and we get really two series of relationships, two series of events. One is the relationship between France and Prote. And this is very playful and it's somewhat adventurous. And we see that early on in the earliest part of the flashback when they're driving down the road and they have to stop and Prote prepares a very interesting snack for France.
Yeah, so you can see her adventurousness there. She's like, oh, ants, great, I'm gonna eat it. So he's kind of teaching her in a way um, African life, African living, at least as he knows it and has experienced. And there's a playfulness to a lot of this relationship, but there is also, this is quite important, a sense that France, even at this young age, is aware of the power dynamics in this relationship. So sometimes when she's uh, cross with her mother or not in the mood to play or has something else going on, she kind of puts Prote in his place. She tells him what to do and she asserts her dominance. What is her dominance? Her dominance as a white person, her dominance as a kind of proxy representative of the colonial power, her dominance as her father and mother's daughter, and so on. So even though clearly Prote has you know, physical power over her, he's an adult, she's a child, um, he knows the lay of the land much better than she, um, he's very aware, and this is important in the film, he's very aware of the, the layers and levels of hierarchical privilege and power in the world of this film. The other relationship that's explored wonderfully uh, in this first half is the relationship between Prote and Amy, the mother. And she is very much in charge of the house and the farm, but also keeps commenting that with her husband away, the, the boys, as they're constantly referred to, the servants, um, are letting things go a little bit. For example, she has this wonderfully sort of funny but frustrating confrontation with the household chef who insists on cooking English meals. Enoch, fini. Le Yorkshire pudding, la crème renversée, la viande bouillie. Stop, basta, assez. Compris? Explique lui, Prote. Madame say no one porridge and Yorkshire pudding for this house again. Enough. Compris? Et ces livres, il doit y avoir des centaines de recettes là-dedans. Je veux de la cuisine française variée. Des pâtes, des salades, tu comprends? Madame say you want a chop for French baby. And he sure say other can chop the inside of your book. Madame, le noc ne sait pas lire. Tu plaisantes, il a toujours le nez dans son bouquin. Madame say me a delay. Say you know the sabi book. Oh, inspiration! I call on the great spirit of cooking to make me think and cook good dinner. Oh, madame. Il va me rendre folle. So, she expresses these frustrations in a variety of ways throughout this part of the film, and Prote ends up being the one to deal with it. Uh, the film does a fine job of showing how different languages are spoken by different residents of the household and also of conveying without kind of spelling it out that Cameroon is a country that or would become a country that because of its colonial past has different European languages as its main languages mainly French and English although there's some German as well and some of the residents some of the Cameroonians are more fluent in English while others are more fluent in French and some of them know both. And Prote often is the person who has to deal with this language situation because Amy and the family only speak French. Um, and so Prote has to deal with translating either from French to English or French to one of the languages that the, the, the boys speak. Um, and we see through these sequences that Prote is incredibly good at his job and it seems incredibly dedicated to his job and so as he goes about kind of maintaining calm and maintaining control over the household 
in me notices this and <laughs> there are a lot of gazes at this point in the film a lot of meaningful gazes where we see her looking at Prote watching him sometimes unbeknownst to him sometime with him knowing it we also see Prote looking at Amy with her sometimes noticing it and sometimes not noticing it and what's clear from all this is that there is an attraction there's a very clear attraction between these two and it's something that they can't act upon or at this point they choose not to act upon but this tension builds and, and Amy much like her daughter is sometimes willing to let Prote be freer uh, less formal more informal in the household and sometimes for reasons probably different from her daughter but that the daughter Franz probably picks up on reels it back in and reestablishes the formality. Uh, for example, at one point while her husband's still gone, this uh, British officer visits the house and it's implied that they know each other from the past and that he's quite formal and has quite formal expectations about how dinner will be served, what the relationship is between whites and their servants and so on. And when he's there to make a show of her knowledge of how this works and her willingness to sort of follow protocol, Amy kind of keeps Prote at a distance except also she does it. There's this lovely scene where she has informed Prote how to you know set the formal dinner, get everything ready, get the champagne ready and so on and she's dressing for something that seems to be like semi-formal I guess you could say and Prote arrives to tell her this. Oui? Madame, l'anglais met le smoking. Oh no! Dans sa marée jaune, juste un petit coup de fer, ça ira. Madame, je sers l'apéritif. Attends, entre. Approche-toi. Aide-moi à protéger, veux-tu Aide-moi. So you can see in that moment that she's on the one hand relieved that he's informed her, oh no, this is formal, this is black dye, he's wearing his tuxedo. Um, and she goes right in to sort of take charge, well this is what we have to do to fix that. But there's also a sense there of relief that she has that Prote is watching out for her. So it's a very complex and complicated relationship and this is where it becomes more than just an examination of oh, forbidden love or an adulterous affair or something like that. There's a real sort of analysis going on here of the colonial relationship. And that colonial relationship is one of skewed kind of symbiosis, skewed parasitism. You know, the Europeans, the whites have come to Africa, to Cameroon, to rob it of its resources, to rob it of its people, uh, to establish outposts for their own people to migrate to and so on. But they don't always understand the world in which they live. They don't understand what's going on there. And even in a case like this, where it's a very formal European situation, she is in this outpost and she needs the help of a local or a native um, to manage everything. And because Protea is so good at that, that increases her, I wouldn't say dependence, but perhaps it's her dependence upon him, but certainly her reliance upon him to help out. And as she comes to rely on him, that sense of romantic sexual tension or yearning grows. Denis and Alasraki's camera work throughout the film contribute to that tension and it's a wonderfully shot and composed film 
beautiful sequences. And it, it does something that I love. If you've watched this channel, I, you know I've talked about this in the past, and that is to contrast still shots, long held still shots that become almost kind of tableau with a gently moving, somewhat roaming camera. And it also makes use of Terry Flamand's production design uh, to create visual connections and visual contrast. So for example, we get shots of Mark, Francis' father, uh, sketching things as he's out on his sort of sojourn with, with the boys. And then at different times in the film, you know, it's not cut right together, at different times we get images of France sketching as well. And this creates a sort of visual relationship between the two, which is a relationship of father-daughter, but also a relationship of white, and also a relationship of colonizer, and so on. Um, I also get this nice visual comparison where when the English officer comes and, and me's preparing, she tells Prote that he must wear formal wear as well if he's going to serve. And so we get these shots of him in his red and white. And then as the film develops, you also notice that the house itself has some red and white decor. And there's a connection there, I think, that's meant to be that no matter how... Um, free or how sort of um, recognized Prote becomes in the film, he's also just to Amy, to Mark when he returns, and even to France, he is just a part of the house, right? And that, that those shots of the decor and his outfit show that. They, they, they make that relationship visually apparent, even though nobody ever kind of states it directly. One of my favorite composed shots, one of the great sort of sequences in the film, comes near the end of this first half of the flashback, before Mark has returned, while Amy and France are still kind of in control of the household with Prote. And it's when Prote goes to have a shower, and it's just a wonderful moment. And if you look at the, the way the shot's composed with the buildings in the background, with Prote's positioning within the frame, and then Bancolet's performance here, the way Denis sort of celebrates, but also masks his body with the suds, and then what happens when, even at a distance, Amy and France happen to pass him on the other side of a building, while he's showering. Just watch the sequence and think about how it's composed, what's going on, and then Prote's response to their appearance. It's just a, an amazing scene that's fraught with so much emotion and such a quick switch of emotion where as he's showering, there's this sense of, I mean, it's, he's just having a shower, but it's this, he's free, he's comfortable in his body, he's happy, he is kind of like at one, <laughs> you know? And if you've ever had a great shower, especially after a long day of work and the heat, you know that feeling of, it's just relief. Release. It's, it is a moment of being, yeah, at one with yourself in your body. And, and free. And then these two women, this woman and young girl, who he has a positive relationship with, perhaps even, you know, a burgeoningly, you know, forbidden but desired sexual relationship with, in terms of the mother, Amy, appear and everything that they represent comes with them, including that tension and that forbidden love, including their power over him. And he just 
almost collapses and he, the frustration in that moment, I love it because it's unexpected, but it makes total sense. And, and, and it, it, to me, that's like that scene almost, there's another one that I'll talk about in a moment, kind of encapsulates the power of what's going on in this film. Because even at a distance, the reminder of his situation robs him of that moment of freedom. Ami does not give in to her feelings for Prote. Eventually, Mark returns. And soon after, the second half of the kind of flashback memoir kicks off, which leads to the sort of third film within this film. And that begins with the arrival of a plane. Bon, allez, ça suffit, petite fourmi. Les avions tombent pas derrière la montagne, ils passent la ligne d'horizon. C'est quoi la ligne d'horizon? The plane crashes. It goes beyond the horizon, which will become important later. But it, it, it's not destroyed. It doesn't crash and burn. It just has a rough landing, as we find out. And the pilot and many of his passengers show up at Mark and Amy's house and they need parts, they need to build a runway, and it's gonna take several weeks to a month to get everything ready for them to depart. So Mark and Amy, being fine representatives of France, invite these people to stay with them. And this brings unexpected, or perhaps expected, untold um, tensions, um, reversals and the different approaches that these different characters have to the situation in the household help to reveal the fissures in late European colonialism as it occurs or as it was occurring in Africa in Cameroon and you get this early on so one we get the pilot we get um, a missionary we get uh, a coffee grower, and we get this guy, Luke, to whom I'll return in a moment. And the coffee grower has plantations in the south of Cameroon, and he needs to get back there right away. And um, one of the moments of tension, sort of colonial tension, occurs when some local chieftains, it's never really explained, but men of power show up to help support the guests. They bring a goat, which is going to be used for, for food. And Ami has quite a good relationship with them. She's thankful to them. Thank you for doing this. Um, it's a little bit of a flex for them because they're helping out the colonial power, but also letting her know what they have, that they have their own power and so on. But the coffee plantation owner wants them to take him south. They arrive in a jeep and he wants to get there as quickly as he can. And he approaches it like this. Accept this present, Aimé, for the people of the avion. Hey, it's your taxi. Delpich, let me present our dear friend, the Wajiri Jatan. Monsieur Delpich is a planter in the sud. The café, isn't it? Yes. How much do you take to bring me to Yaoundé? We were going to dinner. Do you want to stay with us, Jatan? No. Thank you, Aimé. It's your Ramadan. Good luck. Take your price. Au revoir, Aimé. Merci pour votre générosité, Jatao. Oui. Il est superbe. Merci. Il est. IG. Tiens Mais c'est mon dernier prix. So you see there's a real kind of chauvinism in his attitude. He has this expectation, first of all, that they'll drop whatever they're doing and drive him to southern Cameroon. But second of all, that he can just buy their acquiescence with money. And this is a sort of colonialist mindset like you, your life. It, Ramadan's going on, I don't think I've said, but Ramadan is going on right now. So many of the residents of Cameroon, not all of them, are in kind of a fasting, limited work situation. So he thinks, whatever you're doing, drop it to take care of my needs. Oh, you won't just help me, the white man? I'll give you money. 
you don't want my money, I'll give you more money. Listen, you must do this. And they're scorned to him. And I think their ability to scorn him with such ease is really important because that is a moment of late colonialism. That is a moment where those men know this is almost over, dude. Your, your power is, if not gone, has dramatically waned. And it, it, it's one of these moments, I mean, that shows the kind of fissures in this situation. A key figure who arrives is Luke. And Luke is one of my favorite characters in the film. He's horrible, <laughs> but he's a really interesting addition. Um, and he, I think, complicates this film, not just within its narrative and within its sort of character dynamic, but for viewers as well, for Western viewers <laughs> in particular, because Luke is the cool guy. Luke's got long hair. Luke, early after his arrival, hangs out with the boys. He eats with them. He works with them. He wants to do manual labor. He's traveling. We're told he's a traveler. And so Luke, in a way, early on, represents the kind of enlightened, sort of hippie beat um, new European. Now this is, you know, this is a flashback from the 80s, so we're back in the, in the 60s. Um, so he's probably got some sort of revolutionary vibe of, I understand the black man, or something like that. Um, and the film clearly sets him up this way. Uh, one of the women who's been on the plane as well is kind of in love with him. And he's like, no, I've got my traveling to do. Um, and when he's offered a place to stay and a place to eat with the whites, he's like, he doesn't say no, but he's kind of like, I'm okay here at first. But then Luke starts to spend more time with and me in particular, also Mark, and the white people. And his chauvinism comes out dramatically. One of my favorite scenes in the film, which is just awful, is when Luke is sitting there with Emmy and he's reading to her. What a jerk. <laughs> Read to your friends, it's great. But the way he does it, he's reading to her a passage about the black African. And I think it's meant to show that he has done his research. He understands the soul of Africa. But watch what happens as he's trying to read this passage to her. Au milieu des visages africains d'un noir bronzé, la couleur blanche de la peau évoque décidément quelque chose de pareil à la mort. Moi-même en 1891, quand après n'avoir vu pendant des mois que des gens de couleur, j'aperçus à nouveau Qu'est-ce qu'il y a pour Moi-même en 1891, quand après n'avoir vu pendant. Je pose le plateau, protège. Moi-même en 1891, quand après n'avoir vu pendant des mois que des gens de couleur, j'aperçus à nouveau près de la Bénouée les premiers Européens. Je trouvais la peau blanche antinaturelle à côté de la plénitude savoureuse de la noire. Peut-on alors blâmer les sauvages autochtones de prendre l'homme blanc pour quelque chose de contre-nature, pour une créature surnaturelle ou démoniaque There is a black African man standing there trying to help him in the sense that he's bringing him a drink. And Luke is completely, like, he ignores him, is scornful to him, and is, you know, he's a jerk. He's a total jerk. He's a total chauvinistic, racist jerk. But he believes himself to be enlightened. And this is what I mean by how his, his appearance and his character complicates this film, I think, for sort of astute viewers, because you're gonna watch, ooh, Claire Denis, oh, she's a, such an important filmmaker. Ooh, it's about colonialism in Africa and how bad it was. And I'm gonna watch this and understand it. Like Luke, with his book. <laughs> so, and I think he set up on his first arrival to appear sympathetic, to appear enlightened and liberal, so that when his chauvinism and racism starts to come out, that's intentional. 
And I think that's a kind of a direct address to the European American viewer. <sighs> Shit. Um, things are going to come to a head with Luke. Luke, kind of to his credit, or however we want to describe it, starts to see the tension between Prote and Amy. He recognizes it for what it is. And what this does, or the effect this has, is to compound his chauvinism. Because he's already, as the young, virile, sexy man, shown that he's somewhat um, disturbed by Prote's presence. He's disturbed by Prote's um, attractiveness, his virility, but also his competence, his knowledge, the fact that he is kind of running this place and that he knows he's running this place and that he has these formal on the surface but intimate relationships with Amy and France. And so Luke finds this disturbing despite all of his sort of progressive enlightenment. Um, and it's going to come to a head in a scene near the end of the film when he confronts Prote. Hey, tire-toi, laisse-moi seul. Combien de fois faut te le répéter, fils de pute? Qu'est-ce que t'as? Ça te convient pas? Allez, fous-moi le camp. Va lécher les bottes de tes patrons. C'est pire que les curés qui t'ont dressé. Hein. This is the big confrontation here, and this is meant to be, I think, kind of the, the symbol of a late colonialist and post-colonialist Africa finally pushing the oppressor away. And in some ways it's a little bit on the nose in that sense, but it's what happens directly after that that's incredibly important. And this is one of the lovely still shots, and I love the way the camera doesn't move, and the stillness of what happens within these shots. Finally, Amy gives in to her feeling. Finally, she acknowledges something. And Prote, what is going on with him here? It's just like such a wonderful performance. It's such a wonderful moment, the way he picks her up. He takes control to say no to the emotions that he's also trying to control, because he's clearly in love or in lust with her as well. But he's not going to give in to that. He's not going to let his triumph over Luke, which has somehow encouraged her to finally give in, he's not going to allow her that moment of kind of triumph over him. Because if he engages in any kind of intimacy with her, even though Africa is ascendant and colonialism is coming to its end, it ain't over yet. 
and that's going to spell trouble for him. And he knows that. So he maintains charge of this situation in an almost violent, but actually very sort of, I, I feel like when he lifts her up and kind of holds her there, what he's saying is, get a hold of yourself. I know, you know, but no, it's not going to happen. And it's a, it's a wonderful moment in the film, but it leads to the sort of, not so much tragic end, but the natural end when Amy goes to Mark the next day and says, I need Prote out of the house. He has to go and work somewhere else. He does in the end go work somewhere else. Mark says, oh, he can work in the garage. And we see him there later on. And <laughs> one of my, I have many favorite parts in this film, obviously one of my sort of the last favorite moments is when he's working in the garage and France comes in and oftentimes European films that want to be critical of the treatment of Africa or Asia through the centuries of colonialism create a kind of nobility in the, the Africans, the Asians, you know, what, what Edward Said would call Orientalism or one aspect of Orientalism, the sense that these wonderful and beautiful creatures that we sullied with our European ways. And that can be just as problematic as the sort of more direct, brutal um, colonialism that they're criticizing because it continues to deny um, Africans, Asians, Polynesians, and so on, humanity. And I love that Prote gets this final moment of sort of petty brutality where he's working in the garage and Franz comes in to see him. Who knows what's happening here? It's, it's very petty in a way. Like, come on, little girl. You know, he's taking out his anger at having been banished to the garage on the little girl who has scolded him and has on occasion demeaned him, but whom the film has shown through most of its runtime actually kind of adores him and he adores her. So why he would do this is, is not necessarily clear and it's certainly not noble, but also he might be teaching her a lesson here and it's a lesson about pain. And this lesson can be contrasted with one that her father tries to teach her. And her father refers back to their conversation about the horizon when the plane crashed. And he tries to tell her something about what horizons are. And this is meant to be, I think, a metaphor for the film, for colonialism, for racism, and so on. Let's have a look. Plus tu t'approches de cette ligne et plus elle s'éloigne. Si tu marches vers elle, elle s'éloigne. Elle te fuit. Ça aussi, il faudra que je te l'explique. Tu vois cette ligne. Tu la vois, elle n'existe pas. So if you read about this film, this metaphor comes up a lot, you know, that he's trying to teach her that the line, the horizon line, the, the, the barrier in this case between land and sky, but also between black and white, between Europe and Africa, between colonial power and colonized, that this, these lines are, are made up. It's kind of a cliche though. And I think if you contrast that, and it makes sense. I mean, I talk to my son about this kind of stuff as well. So sometimes we teach children through cliche and it makes sense that the father who's become exasperated with the situation by this point would tell his daughter, like all of these things that are keeping us in these boxes are, are divisions of our own creation. That's a good lesson to learn. 
But what Prote shows her with the pipe is that regardless of whatever metaphors you might learn about life, there's a pain to life that will surprise you as he surprises her there. And I think that's what gives the film in moments like that, it's personal power that keeps it from becoming a sort of superficial meditation on the evils of colonialism. It's also a close examination of what this whole process has done to France. Soon after that, the plane is ready to go and we get another wonderful cut where the plane takes off and we believe that we're flying with the plane over the trees and then the way that it's edited, we see the adult France again and she's back in the car and she finds out that this man who's picked her up is actually named William and he's an American. And we get a few more minutes with these two as he kind of explains his situation to her. He's an American, he's come to Africa in the sort of back to Africa moment and they've rejected him. Well, they haven't rejected him, but they don't care about him. And he is implied that his wife is African and he's there to raise his son, they've split up. Um, and he's having trouble fitting in. And so it's short, but this is, as I was saying at the beginning, this is part of that sort of trenchant observation about post-colonial Africa, uh, what it is compared to what people expected that it would be. And this kind of ties in, I think, to Prote's life and Prote's last lesson with the pipe to France. That Life's not always going to deal you what you want it to deal you. I, Prote, am not going to guide you through everything. I am not going to necessarily always be your friend, just like you haven't always been mine. So you, William, black American who wants to come and enjoy the benefits of shared blackness with uh, a continent and a country that have been under the yoke of colonialism for the past several centuries. You're not our number one priority. And that thematically, even though it's very short, dramatically, thematically ties in to the story of young France and Prote in ways that deepen that story very effectively. Thanks for watching everybody. This is a really great film. When I was putting together this French spring film list, I really thought I would do Un Beau Travail, which is probably Denis's most famous film, also about sort of post-colonial Africa. Um, beautifully shot, beautifully choreographed, an amazing film that you should definitely check out. But I wanted to do Chocolat because of the subtlety of its storytelling. And it's, it's very effective at changing gears in ways that you don't notice at first. And as it does so, each new section deepens the previous section and also the section to come. And as you watch the film and rewatch the film, these different parts of it are constantly informing the other parts of it. And it's a, it's a masterful film and it's a masterful first film. So if you haven't seen it, check it out for sure. It's a wonderful film from 1988. If you've made it this far in the video, as I always say, please hit the like button. Please subscribe to my channel and please tell your friends about it. Share this video and we'll have one more film. We're going to return to Chabrol as he was kind of the, the filmmaker who kicked off my whole idea for this. And as I said at the top, check out my community page for the poll on what to do next. Until then, this is Movie Talk with Aaron Hunter. I'm Aaron Hunter. Keep watching movies.